Well, hello, folks. How are you? You doing okay? Yeah, good. Um, well, we're super thankful that you're, uh, you're here in the room. It's a real drag when you're not. Um, I've tried this before to an empty room. It's not quite the same. Uh, online family, thanks for joining us as well. Super thankful uh, for every single one of you. And uh, I got to worship online uh, with some of you that are online last week. And uh, I got to see some of the chat stuff that goes on. So right now, those of you that are online chatting, go ahead and chat with each other. That's what's so cool. They're actually interacting. And we have some pastoral staff and other staff that are also answering questions live while the thing's going on. And so it's a pretty special, uh, special opportunity to minister in, in that regard. So um, today, I'm going to ask that you take notes, uh, even if you're not a note taker. OK, some of you are panicking right now because you didn't bring anything to write with or write on. OK, that's all right. Um, grab your phone. Um, text yourself or, or type notes on your phone or whatever, or I'm not going to judge you. Um, I believe that many of you are, are capable of memorizing every single thing that I'm saying. Okay. And so those of you that aren't out there jotting notes down, then, then do it here. And I, and I say that um, somewhat jokingly, but someone, somewhat not, because for me, um, what we have been covering so far uh, in this series called Strongholds uh, is, has been so key. Uh, we have seen and heard stories of people being freed uh, from a lot of addictions and a lot of struggles and a lot of strongholds uh, that the enemy has had them trapped in for a very, very long time. I myself have even sensed God breaking through on some key areas of my life just in these last several weeks. If you have not been a part of us for the last four weeks or so, I'd really encourage you to go back and take a listen. Because this is key for those of you uh, that have been walking with Jesus for a really long time. This is key for those of you that are brand new in your relationship with Christ. This is also absolutely key and crucial uh, for those of you that, that you, you know, you go, I, I'm not even there yet, but I'm just trying to process what this is all about and, and see what... God and his word uh, have for me. And so um, today what I would really like to do is be able to summarize a bit as we go through a different passage of scripture today. But I'd also like to talk about some uh, preventative measures that you and I can take. Because we've been talking about these strongholds that the devil establishes in our life that cause a whole lot of damage and destruction to us. And we've talked about how God can break through those strongholds, come in and set us free. But as the journey has unfolded, as the series ends up, I'm getting increasingly heavy hearted that when we walk out of here, that we have been freed from some strongholds, but we're also able to uh, limit, uh, slow down, uh, prevent altogether the future establishment of strongholds in our life. And there's a passage of scripture that I want to look at today because I think the ripple effects of what the enemy is able to do in our life can last for a really, really long time. There's some stuff that you were exposed to or happened to you or you got involved in or whatever a long time ago. And the enemy ever since then has continued to lie to you, continued to hurt you, continue to gain traction in your life. And the ripple effects of that are tremendous. Just at the end of last week, another school shooting in California. And this time in Santa Clarita, California, at a high school, actually, that was about two minutes from the church that Pastor Mike and I worked at before we moved here. And so we both have friends on the staff of that school. There are kids in my youth group there who have a lot younger siblings that were at the school uh, that day. And it, it, the, the nature of these things happening over and over again, uh, it, it's just disgusting. I'm somewhere between absolutely heartbroken and disturbingly numb 
I just came and believed that this is kind of the, the world we're, we're in right now. And I can't help but think about a moment like that last Thursday on that school campus, the ripple effects negatively that now will follow some of those kids or those teachers or those family members for years and years and years. And that it's an opportunity here for the enemy to gain a whole bunch of traction. At the same time, I'm confident in what we have been talking about in God's word uh, for the last month. And that is, yes, there's a lot of activity of the enemy. There's a lot of junk going on. We live in a sinful, broken world and the devil is real. But greater is he who is in us the Lord, Jesus Christ, than he, lowercase h, who is in the world. He has greater power and ability than the enemy does. They're not equals. And so we're not walking through all of this stuff and the state of our world today or whatever it is that you happen to come in here today without hope. We're not. Like John talked about in the worship here, we have a living hope, and it isn't just the feeling, it's the person of Jesus Christ. But for you to be able to lean in today, to take some notes today, I think would be really helpful, not just for today, but for going forward as well. If you have your Bible, I'd love for you to open up to the book of Matthew and go to chapter 12. Matthew chapter 12. As you're turning there, um, let me just kind of paint the picture of what's going on. Jesus's ministry on earth is well underway at this point. And in this particular chapter, um, Jesus is kind of ruffling some feathers. There's some religious elite called the Pharisees that continually are having a hard time figuring out who he is, what he's about, frustrated, bothered by him. Uh, there's crowds of people that seem kind of magnetically drawn to him and are coming to him. And in this particular moment in time, uh, Jesus has been doing what Jesus does. And he is about the business of healing people and working in people's lives. In this particular moment, it happens to be on the Sabbath, though, the day off. And the religious people didn't think that you could work or do anything on the Sabbath, including even healing. And so uh, they're bothered by that and conversations break out. Jesus heals someone that had a withered hand. Uh, then crowds come and he heals them. And then a, a man that had been demon possessed and was blind and mute comes to him. And Jesus heals him so that he can see and speak. And now in reaction to this, the Pharisees have had enough and they, they basically are trying to explain away what's going on. And they begin to think, well, the only reason that he can do this is because he's somehow in concert with Satan. The only reason Jesus can cast out demons is maybe because he's demonic or evil himself. And knowing what they're thinking, Jesus says what we're going to look at here today. And so here's what I'd like to do. I would like to read this passage and just have you listen. It's not going to be on screen. Then after that, after we kind of get the tone, the whole scope of what's going on, we're going to double back and take a couple of verses at a time. And at the end of that, uh, I drew something for you. <laughs> yeah, you could be real excited right now. Um, but I drew some things that maybe double back yet again and help us visualize what God's word is saying to us here. Matthew chapter 12, verses 25 through 30. Let me just read this to you first. Jesus knew their thoughts and said to them, every kingdom divided against itself will be ruined. And every city or household divided against itself will not stand. If Satan drives out Satan, he is divided against himself. How then can his kingdom stand? 
And if I drive out demons by Beelzebul, by whom do your people drive them out? So then they will be your judges. But if it is by the spirit of God that I drive out demons, then the kingdom of God has come upon you. Or again, how can anyone enter a strong man's house and carry off his possessions unless he first ties up the strong man? Then he can plunder his house. Whoever is not with me is against me. And whoever does not gather with me scatters. Right now, at this very moment, as was in the moment that Jesus spoke these things, there are two kingdoms at war with each other. There is the kingdom of Almighty God, and there is the lowercase k kingdom of the prince of this world, the prince of the air, Satan. Now, it just begs the question then, which kingdom are you a part of? And I don't, I don't say this lightly. These, these are heavy thoughts. They're heavy questions. But there is a spiritual battle that's going on. And there were th this war has been going on for quite some time. Now, we're caught up in it. And the crowds and the Pharisees are trying to uh, decipher a bit of which kingdom is at play here. That's pretty big for me and you. If we double back and look at verses 25 and 26, Jesus knew their thoughts, the Pharisees, and said to them, Every kingdom divided against itself will be ruined, and every city or household divided against itself will not stand. If Satan drives out Satan, he is divided against himself. How then can his kingdom stand? Now, this is key. Jesus' argument is super clear. His argument is any kingdom divided against itself will not stand. And that's just logic. That just makes sense. If Satan is turning against his own kingdom by casting out demons, then his kingdom's not going to last. Does Satan want his kingdom to not last? No, he wants it to continue. He wants it to grow. At his orchestration, Demons may give way to another greater strength, power of evil, but they're not fighting against each other. Any kingdom divided against itself will stand. You see that in nations. You've seen that in your own households, perhaps. And I'm certain that you've seen it in your own heart and in your own life. When your own heart and soul is divided against itself, it's not going to stand. The more wishy-washy we are, the more flimsy we are, the more loosey-goosey we are, the more that we live in the gray area, the more unstable we are. And that poses a real threat for me and you as we try to walk out our, our life we don't really know who we are. We don't know uh, what kingdom we belong to. We, we don't know what to stand for, or we selectively choose, today I'll stand for this, but tomorrow it might be different. I'll wait and see how I feel at the time. A kingdom divided against itself will not stand. Now, the point Jesus is making here is pertaining to the enemy. He's explaining to the Pharisees, this doesn't even make sense what you're saying. I'm casting out demons I'm inflicting damage on Satan's kingdom. Why would Satan want to do that to his own kingdom? And then the next verse, verse 27, he says, if I drive out demons by Beelzebub, Beelzebul, see, in the Old Testament, there was uh, Beelzebub, how many of you heard that before? Okay. Um, it was, uh, 
It was a phrase that kind of loosely translated meant Lord of the Flies. And it was a pagan god uh, representing everything uh, rotten, disgusting. Uh, by the time that uh, the New Testament is being authored, the Jews had changed from Beelzebub to Beelzebul, which means Lord of the Dung. Not a whole lot better. But it was basically a reference to a pagan god that represented everything disgusting and filthy. To the point that by the time they are making this reference here, Jews used that term interchangeably for Satan. And so Jesus is just saying, if I drive out demons by the power of Satan, by whom do your people drive them out? So then they will be your judges. Now, don't miss it. This is a real zinger from Jesus. I love this. He basically said, hey, guys, uh, some of your people cast out demons occasionally, right? Yes. Okay, well, when I cast out demons by the power of Satan, supposedly, is that the same power that your people use when they cast out demons? Oh, he got them. They'd go, oh, no, 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 we, we do it. Oh, okay, okay. Verse 28. But if it is by the spirit of God that I drive out demons, then the kingdom of God has come upon you. Okay, if it doesn't make sense that the enemy would attack his own kingdom, then it leaves the other option here. If I am doing miracles of healing if I'm now teaching with authority, if I am casting out demons, this is essentially proof that he is the king of kings and the Lord of lords. He is the Lord. He is God Almighty. He is the Messiah that has been promised for centuries. And the king of the Lord has come and is ushering in his kingdom. You know that wherever the Lord is, there is his kingdom. He's establishing a kingdom in you, in our church family. And he's uh, desiring that that kingdom would be established globally. And we know the end of the story. Someday it will be. He's implying that he's the king, and he is. He's implying that the kingdom has already come, and it's the kingdom of God. He is the Lord. Now, 2 Corinthians chapter 3, verse 17 says, Now, the Lord is the Spirit. And where the spirit of the Lord is, there is freedom. Oh, that's good. Now, the Lord is the spirit, just affirming the Trinity. They're one and the same. And where the spirit of the Lord is, there is freedom. Anytime you think about the kingdom of God, think about freedom. He's got tremendous freedom for you and for me as a part of his kingdom. If you're a child of God, if you're in a relationship with Jesus, you are a part of his kingdom. And you're a part of a kingdom that is free from sin and temptation. Jesus, the King, the Messiah, has already broken the back on sin and given the ability for you to go a different way, to be a part of a different kingdom than the kingdom of Beelzebul or Beelzebub or Satan or the devil or the enemy, all one and the same. At any given moment, you and I have the opportunity, like Joshua says, to choose this day who you will serve. Joshua in the Old Testament said, as for me and my house, I'm going to serve the Lord. There's tremendous blessing there. 
He, he says, Jesus says, it's by the spirit of God that I cast these demons out. Jesus could have done it of his own power, but he honored the spirit of God and used his energy, the spirit of God, to cast out those demons. They're on the same page. They're not divided against each other, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. And he also showed us a model then. Jesus modeled reliance on the Spirit of God in our struggle against sin and temptation. Because I've got no ability in and of myself. Without Jesus, I got nothing when it comes to fighting off the plans of the enemy. I don't care how strong my will is, how talented, how smart, how physically strong, how emotionally strong. It's all spit when it comes to sparring with the Lord of the flies or the Lord of the dung. But with Jesus, it's a whole game changer. With Jesus, I am not bound to live in the kingdom of the enemy. I, I am free to live in his kingdom. And I am freed from a whole bunch of slavery and junk that belongs to the kingdom of Satan. Verse 29. Jesus says, or again, how can anyone enter a strong man's house and carry off his possessions unless he first ties up the strong man? Then he can plunder his house. What a word picture. This is good right here. Jesus says, okay, I want to I wanna describe it this way. Picture a strong man. In, in Jesus' analogy, the strong man is Satan. A strong man comes into your world. He grabs you. He grabs your kids. He grabs your stuff. And because he's strong, he's able to drag you into his household, lock you up in his stronghold, and then keep you and your kids and your stuff all right there. And the only way, if that were a literal sort of situation, that you could overcome the strong man, say the strong man is Arnold Schwarzenegger or Dwayne The Rock Johnson. If that is the strong man, then someone who's stronger than the strong man needs to come in, overpower Schwarzenegger or The Rock, then get into the house to get all the people and the family and the stuff free and then remove them out of that situation into a lot better situation. Amen. And Jesus is saying, hey, the strong man's strong. But Jesus is also saying, I am the stronger man. I'm stronger than the strong man. And you need me. And I want to help you. I want to set you free. I am the only one who is able to bind up, tie up the strong man that's been messing with you and messing with your family. I'm also the only one that once he is bound up by my power, then I can come in, breach the wall of the stronghold, grab you and your family, and get you out of there. This is really just another story of the gospel. There's power in the name of Jesus. And not just because of his name, because Acts 19 tells a story about some guys that don't have a relationship with Jesus. They just try to leverage the power of the name of Jesus. And they try to cast out some demons. No relationship with Jesus, just use the name. And they end up getting their butts whipped. Because it's not just the name, it's who the name represents. But when you've got a relationship 
with Jesus, the Christ, the Messiah, the stronger man, now you got some legs to stand on. And when it comes to the struggles we face and and the, the sin we face and the temptations we face, he's our only hope. Verse 30. Man, lean in on this one. Jesus says, whoever is not with me is against me. And whoever does not gather with me scatters. Men and women, friends, family, brothers, sisters, What Jesus is trying to make crystal clear here is that when it comes to relationship with God, there's no middle position. You're with him or you're not. You're on board with his kingdom or you're a part of another kingdom. I don't say that lightly. But Jesus did not give up everything, lay down his life to make a way for me and you to be in a relationship with him so that we could be half in or one foot in and the rest out. While this is very much a passage reminding us of the preeminent, the supreme power of the person of Jesus Christ, over everything, including sin, temptation, death, and the devil. This is also Jesus in the same breath warning us of lukewarm living. There's real danger in that. And so here's here's my drawing. Time to get excited. (laughs) Let me just... Put it this way. If this is us coming through our life, invariably you and I will hit a fork in the road. There will be an opportunity, a temptation, a struggle, a challenge that presents itself in our life. And when these sorts of moments happen, Pastor John talked about knowing your enemy a few weeks ago, which is so key. And that we live between these kind of odd, guard, odd guardrails of what James says, resist the devil and he'll flee from you. And on the other hand, after Jesus was tempted by Satan in the wilderness, it ends with saying, and then Satan left him until an opportune time. So we can resist and the enemy will flee until an opportune time. And he knows what the opportune times are. These forks in the road. And at any given moment, when there's the fork in the road, there is the stronger man, Jesus, right there with you. Remember that. But there is the enemy, Satan, the devil, the strong man, right there with you too. And these forks in the road, these opportunities can happen a whole bunch of times in one day. Or they can be one significant event that happened years ago. Or maybe one that's around the corner. Isn't it weird that sometimes these sorts of moments, it's difficult to even describe, wait a minute, but this just seems so weird. I don't know what I'm supposed to do. There's a fork in the road. Is this, this is either God leading me on to something great or it might be the enemy Want it. Isn't that weird? How could this very same thing in the moment for us, this is either God at work or it's the enemy at work. Except for the reality that we're in a spiritual battle. That's what that moment has in common. And man, we better be sensitive to the Holy Spirit. We better know what the truth is. We better lean in and have our ears tuned in and our hearts soft and open lest we head off the wrong direction when those moments come. 
I also know about these moments right here, these forks in the road. They can be a doorway. You know, you've heard the phrase, you give someone an inch and they'll take a mile. Or you crack the door open this much and someone will fling it right open. That's what the enemy loves to do. He loves, scripture says, to get a foothold so he can stand in your life, in your heart, in your thoughts. And sometimes these moments are a doorway. Uh, You just barely, you unlocked the deadbolt and you open the door and he walked right through just like Kramer. Here I am. (laughs) And now he's there. And that's why these moments are big. Whether they're happening a whole bunch in your journey right now or few and far between, they, are, they can be big doorway moments. The bummer is sometimes these things happen in your life and my life before you even knew what was going on. The enemy bust down the door, came right through and established some territory in you. Something happened to you. It really wasn't your fault. But he's walked in at that opportune time and he's been hanging on there with you ever since. What I also last thing know about these sorts of moments, the fork in the road moments, what opportune times. The enemy loves to, yeah, he'll attack your weaknesses and he knows what they are. But he loves to attack often, if not first, things that were meant to be a real deep blessing from God. Meaning he would love to come after his church because this right here is meant to be a blessing of God. And it makes sense that he's going to, the enemy's going to try to come and wreck this, attack this. He's going to come to your sexuality. He's going to come to your marriage. He's going to come to your family. He's going to come to uh, your prayer life or your time in the word and attack that. You go, well, why? Because those things were meant to be the biggest, hugest blessings in your life. And what a win for him if he can divide and conquer your time with God or divide and conquer your family, divide and conquer this church. So it's just be aware, be sober minded and alert. The scripture talks about Because I'm glad for the strongholds that have been demolished. But again, as we wrap this up, I want to make sure that we are being used by God and sensitive to God so that these strongholds don't get established at the same rate they were before we started talking about this. Okay. The fork in the road. Here's what Jesus has for you. He's got life for you. Eternal life. Abundant life, life to the full. As you trust him, as you're obedient to him, as you walk with him, he has got growth, not always easy, but blessings. And that presses on to more life, more of his kingdom at work in you, more freedom. That's huge. He's the stronger man. This is the better kingdom and the better option. On the other side of the equation, if in this moment, the fork in the road, and you just kind of fall to the default flesh position, what the enemy wants for you is destruction and some sort of slavery. He doesn't have life for you. He's got a dead end for you. He's got a stronghold for you. He's got a prison for you. That's, that's what he's wanting. And if that can remain for all of eternity, then there's the biggest win. There's, there's the two options. There's the two kingdoms. There's the two choices. But back to the even better news. The stronger man, Jesus, What this passage was telling us, what Jesus was telling us here, he has the ability to bind up the strong man. He's got the ability. You don't, I don't. But Jesus does. He's got the ability to go bind, tie up 
the enemy. He's going to do that someday for all eternity, and I can't wait for that day. But in the meantime, anytime you and I experience a victory, anytime that we're freed from sin and temptation, any time that you choose the life direction over the death direction, it's because in that moment, the Lord stepped up, the stronger man stepped up and bound Satan. And he didn't just stop there with binding him. Then he went in and plundered. He'd got Satan tied up. Now he could run into the stronghold, breach the wall, grab you, grab your stuff, grab your family, get you out of there, plunder all the stuff, all the blessings, all the years that the enemy ripped off from you. The stronger man says, I'm getting those years back. I'm going to bring freedom and wholeness and restoration. That's what God does. And I'm going to bring you back into my kingdom, into my plan, back into life. This is what Jesus is reinforcing and saying. This is the story of the power of Jesus Christ. But it's also, as he wraps up, not just verse 30, but if you continued reading on, a very strong call for us to not take this lightly, not to live on the fence. I want to take us back to the beginning. When Jesus says, you're either for me or you're against me, he's just holding up a danger sign, a warning sign to these fork in the road sorts of moments these situations in our life where I don't know what I should do. The moments in our life where we linger a little too long in the temptation, we sit there where we can smell it and we can see it and we can kind of feel it. The longer we harbor certain feelings or certain little pet sins, the longer that we sit there at the fork in the road and don't make a choice about which which direction we're headed, the more time the enemy has to pull you over to his direction, the more time that he has to take what's been harbored there and where you're lingering there and bring damage there. The Bible calls this lukewarm living. Jesus in Revelation says, I can't stand lukewarm. I wish you were hot or cold, but you're just lukewarm. You're in the middle. You're on the fence. You're loosey-goosey. You're kind of half in, you're half out. And it makes me, in Revelation, he says, want to spit you out of my mouth. It's revolting to him. But a lot of why it's revolting to him is because of what he knows the enemy is able to do when we sit on the fence. And so it's like a wound. If you got inflicted with a pretty severe wound and you had the option, one, of going and getting it treated immediately or you got a massive wound And the other option was to kind of, sort of do nothing about it for a while. I mean, which, which is the wiser choice? It certainly isn't just to sit there and pretend like it doesn't exist. The wisest course of action, the course of action that leads to life would be to say, I'm going to get immediate attention for this deal that's wrecking me right now. And praise be to God, you can get immediate attention from a compassionate, merciful, gracious, loving God. He's not wagging his head, shaking his finger at you. He knows how difficult it is to be human and this mess that we get stuck in. And that's why he said, that's why you need me to come in and bind the strong man because I'm the stronger man. And then I'm going to come in and plunder what he's ripped off 
and I'm going to bring you into the life that I had for you. So three things for every single one of us today and going forward. When you start to feel, or if you're feeling right now stuck in a stronghold, confess your sin to the Lord, and he's faithful and just to forgive. Reach out for Jesus. You'll find that he's already in a full-on sprint for you. And then don't linger in the lukewarm. Choose this day who you will serve. And then watch. Watch him gain more and more traction. Watch the kingdom of God gain more and more traction. Watch the heart of God gain more and more traction in you. And less and less room is left to the strongholds and more and more room is left to the stronger man. In the name of almighty God, do it. And so, Father, we just ask, we ask, God, that you would set people free. We ask, God, that right here in this place, that those that are here that need to say no to sin, confess their sin to you, that they would say that to you right now and confess it. And as, as our sympathetic high priest, God, that you would forgive, you would cleanse, you would bind the enemy, run into his territory, grab them, and bring them over into your kingdom. If that's you here right now, you talk to God. You confess your sin and you reach out for Jesus. He loves you more than you can possibly imagine. And he's the only one that can break these strongholds. And for those of you that may be finding yourself on the fence or struggling with some of the lukewarm living, just ask him to strengthen you. Prompt you, move you. More and more. need to talk to somebody afterwards, then take advantage. You made a decision for Christ. We would love to hear about it afterwards. Come tell us. So Father, we just lift our voices to you now. Thanking you that you're the God that's broken apart a whole bunch of strongholds in the last few weeks. And that you're the God that's going to continue to break apart strongholds protect our lives from them being established in the first place as we walk with you. You truly are our living hope. 